Allison Luff, welcome to An Act of Despairs. How are you doing? I'm good. How are you, Ryan? I'm doing so much better now that I'm seeing you and all your radiating energy and the beautiful woodwork behind you. It, it suits you quite well. It's like an ele elegant sauna. But uh, up here, it is a sauna. So if I start sweating, no. <laughs> <laughs> you imagine being in a sauna or a steam room. You just I, I, apparently, that's what everyone's putting in their houses these days because I heard those things are selling like crazy. But uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. But um, yeah, I'm I'm such a big fan of your work. You know, I I uh, you, uh, saw you in Waitress. You were so good in that, and you know, obviously, like you've been doing the musical theater thing, which is like, I have so much respect for that because I just cannot sing or dance, and I'm an actor, and I just like it's just that you know I know my lane, and I I the people that have a voice and and just a presence like yours it's incredible and then now seeing you transition in, into tv and episodic work you know especially heels like what what that character there's uh, there's you know i I'll, I'll be very vague here but there's a uh, a grocery store moment where you just you made me cry you know Oh, thank you. Yeah, I think you know what I'm talking about, but uh, I do. I have it hasn't hit me like that. So, because I just watched that episode recently, and yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah. well, you know, I grew up in in not the real South, Richmond, Virginia, but sort of the beginning of the South. Yeah. So I, I know what it's like to grow up around that world and and people that just you know have to do what they have to do to survive and and we're you know I mean we're we're actors you know we're trying to pursue our dreams and we have to live within that survival world and that's not a spoiler it's very much a in the pilot of that show so congratulations it's, it's such an awesome show thanks man thank you i it's funny that you say that about being actors and making drawing that comparison i've been finding myself drawing that comparison a lot when i talk about it because you know my character stacy who's married to jack spade i think it's really similar being married i'm an actor who's also married to another actor and i draw that comparison a lot when i was filming and whenever i look back on the show of just being married to someone who is doing what they love to do but also doing it to to make money and and hustle and the hardships that come with that and yeah. the gifts that we're given that we're able to do that but how it's not easy and then it brings emotions into it and it brings ego into it and it's yeah it's a tricky thing to navigate so i yeah in comparison for sure well that's incredible and and and, and congratulations to both of you for doing that because i know the sacrifice it takes for two artists to to really do this together so that's so beautiful but if it's cool with you let's start at the beginning where did you grow up yeah i grew up in houston texas um i've got three brothers uh my parents and my and my parents have never nobody in in my family is part of the business or has ever dabbled in the business and knows anything about the business but i yeah i grew up in houston texas and i kind of got into this world because my parents took me to see the pre-broadway run of beauty and the beast no way um, yeah and i think i was like four years old or something um and actually a really cool like full circle story about that when I saw that pre-Broadway run, there was an actor named Kim Huber who played the broomstick in Understudied Bell. And about 18 years later, no, well, I guess not 18, 14 years later, I did a production of Beauty and the Beast and she played Bell. No so, way, did you tell her? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I did, yes, I did tell her, of course. Um, but I, I was four years old and I was just watching it and looked at my parents and said, I wanna do that. And they're like, oh yeah, okay, sure. Um, it's so and, fun. Do you know Cheyenne Jackson? I don't. I don't know him personally, but of course, I you know I know of him. And he, he did the show, and he had like the same experience. So that's so fascinating. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah, it was a different show, but yeah, that's so funny how that happens. It was like full circle moments, but yeah, I, I knew I wanted. I was like, I want to. I didn't even know what it meant, you know. But I was like, I want to do this, and my parents kind of just noticed that I would walk around the house all the time singing, and my mom kind of thought huh you know she's singing on pitch and she uh it's uh it's kind of nice maybe maybe she really does want to do this and she went to the library and looked up how do you you know if you want to do this how do you pursue this like the back yeah. in the day when 
you didn't just have Google on your phone. And no, and it was like that weird dial-up internet that takes forever. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So she looked up how to audition, and you know, one thing led to another. I auditioned for like a singing group, and when I was really young, which opened the door up to community theater when I was seven, and then opened me up to my first professional theater gig at, at ten, and then it's all. You know, I caught the bug at five, so. <laughs> wow, that's so, I'm so jealous of that. That's so cool. I, I did not, I wanted it, but I didn't have the confidence. So I was like 13. So when you start doing it at that age, are you just doing like a, like a chorus or a choir outside of your school, you know, or is it part of your school? Yeah, so I, um, the first thing, it was called Encore's, Encore Youth Performers. And it was a, um, it was like a singing, a singing kind of touring group, a singing, dancing touring group, but I didn't dance. It, it was more of a performance thing. And we would go around different festivals. We'd perform in malls and, and things like that. So that was like the first thing. And in that group, there was kids that did community theater. And so then I would do community theater. And then, it, of course, how things work out, that director who directed those community theater gigs then went to go direct something at a professional theater and asked me to come along. And so I did work at a lot of the professional theaters around Houston, like the Great Caruso and the Hobby Center and Main Street Youth Performer, or uh, Main Street Theater and um, Texas Repertory Theater and things like that. So. Oh, wow. And, and did that have to take you out of school then? Um, I did. I missed a lot of school from time to time. You yeah. Know? Um, I would, I would get out of school early and, but I, I was lucky. I went to school with, because I did it always, I had a lot of teachers that supported me and principals that were like, yeah, she's missing school. And I maintained my schoolwork, but yeah, I did. I did miss some school. Yeah, it's okay. We get, it all paid off. So it was the right move and talk to me, you know, because I, I don't think we're that far in age, but, you know, I know Austin kind of had a moment of being like, you know, a little bit of a film hub before New Orleans and Atlanta were phenomenons, you know, were, were you ever like interested in film and TV and going there or was it mainly theater for you? It I, um, it was, it was mainly theater for me. I, I grew up in Houston, so Austin, you know, was a co two and a half hours away and you know, my my parents had three other kids too. You know, so they they it wasn't just a they could dedicate they gave right. me a vacation and took me everywhere. But at the same time, and I did get an agent when I was younger. But you know, I don't even they wouldn't have known my name. I didn't really know their name. It was yeah. like like yeah, I got an agent, but I wasn't going in for things, and so I was mainly doing theater. I maybe auditioned for one thing as a kid, but it. It was, you know, it wasn't actually going to go anywhere with it, you know? Yeah. So then what, what was your path then? You just kept doing those, you know, theater, different schools and productions until you got to middle school or high school when you had a drama program within your school? Or was it still professional and you didn't focus it on school as much? So I grew up doing it in school as well. I... I wasn't in, there was not really a theater department too much in middle school, um, but in high school I did, I would use, theater was my elective, and I did plays and the music, and all the musicals of the high school, but I, I wasn't able to do all of the, all of the plays and everything that they did because I was always doing professional theater, I mean, to the point where I never even got my license as a teenager, I, I didn't wow. go to I didn't go to prom. I didn't, you know, I, I had shows, so I, I didn't do those things. And I, which was great. And all my friends kind of knew it and the school kind of knew it. And it was just like the thing I did. So it wasn't a big deal, but it did always work out that I could always do my school musical. And I did some of the plays, but I was usually kind of, you know, double fisting at that time and like doing professional theater after my rehearsals at school for whatever the play or the musical was at school at that time yeah that's so awesome and, and i'm curious then did that get you an equity card pretty young so i started getting equity points at a very young age i think i started getting equity points i feel like at my first professional gig so probably at 10 um 
but I actually moved to New York City EMC. So I was not equity when I moved to New York City. I um, I was a couple points away, and I think I could have turned equity, but I wasn't equity as soon as I moved to New York City. I didn't actually get my equity card until um, uh, Spelling Bee, the 25th Annual Putnam County Spelling Bee. Got it. Theater Aspen, that's where I got my equity card. That's beautiful. And I'm curious, you know, obviously you love theater and, and that's your thing. Is that why you went to New York versus L.A.? I mean, I, I just literally interviewed Tim Robbins before you and he's working on a, a play out there. And he was just talking about how the scene, you know, it's it's not the same, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I, I knew I wanted to move to New York as a kid. I was constantly I, I went to my mom, actually. When I was in high school, I think I was a junior in high school, and it was when Spring Awakening was starting to happen. Oh God, so, that was the, the the biggest and the baddest of like. I mean, I God. And I was in the age range of those roles, so I remember going to. I hadn't even been to New York yet either, so wow. I didn't go to New York until I was sixteen. Was the first time I went to New York, and I went there on a trip with my high school boyfriend and his mom and brother. And my parents had never been to New York. And like I said, my parents supported me always 100%. It was never a doubt in their mind where they were like, oh, she's not gonna do this. They were yeah. always in But I, I remember going to my mom, she was laying in bed and I remember walking into her room one night saying, I have to graduate early. I have to, I have to, I have to graduate early. They're doing this musical called Spring Awakening in New York and I'm ripe for it and I, I, I gotta graduate early. Yeah. And my mom was like, okay, slow down. You know, you, uh, you don't have the grades to graduate early. She probably gave <laughs> Yeah. You've been traveling graduating. a lot. Yeah. Like, you're probably not graduating early. You have to make like straight A's to graduate early and, and you don't have straight A's. Um, she, but she was very much like, look, if it's meant to be, it'll still be there when you get there and finish out high school and then move to New York. I fully support you. You've saved up money. I did it all on my own dime. She's like, you've saved up money. You have our complete and 100% support. We can't support you financially over there, but you know, you've, you've earned money, you've saved, go to New York, we, we support you. Um, so then senior year of high school, I, I auditioned for our junior year of high school. I auditioned for colleges and I did I did that whole experience because I wanted to experience that. But I had while I was going to all those generals and auditioning for colleges, I had a year and a half of work already lined up. So mm. at different professional theaters in Houston and Summerstock outside and in Illinois and outside of Chicago and so when I auditioned for those colleges, I was very, very upfront with the schools and I just said, you know, I'm torn because I've done this my whole life and I definitely think there's lots for me to learn and I'm always going to be learning and always going to be, you know, I'm always going to be a student. But at the same time, it's really hard for me to um, think about not working for four years because I've worked since I was a kid. So then to stop working for four years to go to school to work on getting a job to work, I was like, that, that is, yeah. that, that would pain me to then not get to actually work for four years. And unanimously across the board, every single school said, I think you should go to New York. Wow. That's so cool that they, they do. Yeah. Like, yeah. 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 No, um, a lot of them held scholarships for me for a few years, but unanimously across the board, all of them said, I think you should go to New York. Yeah. You had the credits. That's awesome. And, and so, talk to, talk to me about doing that did did you go solo and move alone i did so i um let's see i graduated and for the next year and a half i had work lined up so i couldn't move then but i um i moved at 19 and i, I saved up a lot of money i had a couple friends out there and i bought a one-way ticket i happened to there was a a uh, director in Houston that said, you know, they're having auditions for this new musical that's going to be at this place called Gallery Players in Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. And it's called an equity showcase contract. And you don't basically mean you don't get paid anything, but you get like $125 stipend. Um, and you it, it, it's a new show and you're really right for it. You should go audition. So I bought a one way ticket 
and I had an appointment to audition for this show called Like You Like It, and based off of Shakespeare's As You Like It, to I had an audition, and a couple days later, I moved there 2000, or September 3rd, 2008, and I, it's funny. I had a date on 2000. I had a date on September 4th with a guy I ended up dating for two and a half years. It's still oh, wow. A friend of mine. And I had an audition on September 4th also. And just so happened to go through the gamut of callbacks and, and book the lead in, in that and played Rosalind in that, which was, again, didn't make any money from it. But I moved to New York September 3rd and had, you know, my first way of my first opportunity to be on stage uh, I booked the gig on like September 5th so that it's just one thing leads to another right so that got me my agent because agents came out and saw that and so then I was able to get a New York agent and but I moved there yeah I had a couple friends that lived there and again I was kind of like talking to this guy that lived there that I was going to hang out with and so and I found my first sublet. I stayed with my friend for the first two weeks and then I got on Craigslist and I moved in with two complete strangers, two uh, straight brothers, men, that are these two brothers from like Alabama, John and Dan. Nice. And I found them on Craigslist and lived with these two random guys for, I should definitely write something about that. Cause yeah, you have to, yeah. It was kind of uh, reminding me of heels. So I was like, it's <laughs> exactly right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I moved in with them and uh, lived with them for a few months in Astoria. Uh, I <laughs> set the wall of my New York apartment on fire the first week I lived there. I'm sure they were thrilled about that. By, um, by candle accident or? Yeah. So yeah, I, I got there a with, candle going right now. I always. <laughs> I, I moved there with um, a suitcase, a backpack and a purse and a dream. You know, no. Uh, I've moved there with this literally one suitcase, a backpack, and a purse, and I didn't have any. I didn't like have all these funds to go buy curtains and this or that. So you know, I like hung up my scarves as curtains and like you know, I made this like bohemian oasis yeah. with what I had, and I scotch taped photos to the wall and just decorated like I knew how with no money. And yeah, I, I was reading the script to the new show I got, and the candle was going and. I woke up to heat on my face and the all of my scarves and my tapestries and my pictures were just in flames and the wall was just on fire on the sixth floor apartment of an Astoria. Were they able to salvage it? Yes, it was fine. I didn't hurt anyone. I just was like, ah! And, and John and Dan ran in and I grabbed a blender full of water and like tried to put the fire out, which did absolutely nothing. And they <laughs> They like I'm, patted it and like, you know, threw things out the window and it was fine. And they're like, Allie, girl, are you all right? Um, and, and it worked out. It was fine. But that that's is awesome. Are they, are they still in your life at all? They're not. I haven't. Talked yeah. To them. Oh, my God. I don't I don't even know. I, probably since I moved out. <laughs> well, hopefully this podcast will find them and, and they'll laugh about okay. that. That's so awesome. So then getting that agent does that change pretty much everything for you because now you're not the only one hustling for yourself or having friends reference you for things do you start getting seen i mean was was spring awakening still going at this point spring awakening was still going um but i didn't i never got an audition for it you know um, really i could totally see you in that yeah i didn't I didn't, I, I had that agent, but um, I still wasn't able to, you know, I wasn't getting in the door. I didn't have, what I found interesting was, you know, I didn't have a, I didn't have a credit. I didn't have University of Michigan on my resume. I didn't have yeah. on my resume. So that then there, I ran into that, right? I didn't go to school. I had this experience, but yeah. I didn't have this, uh, not like the I didn't have the pedigree of all the, you know, I didn't yeah. Have this, I didn't have the brand so these major casting directors didn't they didn't have any way of knowing me they didn't see me in a showcase yeah so but it it, it all works out how it's supposed to right I I got an agent and and it was the first time I I met with a couple agents actually I met with kind of a bigger one and then I met with a um another one that I actually stayed with up until like two years ago a year and a half oh, ago wow. 
he's like family to me and we went through a lot he got me my first equity card he got me my first tour my first broadway show all seven of my broadway shows he got with me and we went through a lot and um and then it was just time for me to move on a couple yeah. years ago but i yeah i was a nanny for a while like it didn't just right when i got an agent so you did have to survive and do the kind of waitress when i say waitress i mean the show not the job like you had to live that life for a bit yeah so i was um i became a nanny for a family that i still talk to that i just i love and i did a few days a week with them and they again i was fortunate that they were super supportive of me and um, the parents were very hands-on. They could just, you know, have the extra help, so they did. And I was really close with, with the entire family and they loved the fact that they weren't necessarily musical or creative individuals. So they brought people into their lives to put in their children's lives who yeah. were that, you know, to, which is such a cool, you know, I learned so much from them and so much from their parenting and they're just beautiful people and I really really hit the jackpot with them um and and so yeah they were always really flexible if I you know I said I have an audition they were like go you know go and or I I got a job I'm going to be leaving for two two months and they would support me and go and that's come so to- cool that's so hard to find Allison that's so cool yeah thanks yeah it was very cool it's not lost on me about that you know that's sure. awesome and and you know, for those listening, because uh, I don't think a lot of people understand the dynamics and the uh, the bureaucracy of the theater game, you know, in, in, in you know, because you're a film and TV actress as well. Basically, the way it works is, you know, you get a co-star, then you get a guest star, then maybe a reoccurring, you know, and then maybe a series reg, you know, for for musical theater. How does it work? Is it like swing, you know, featured? It's- right like you think that's how it works and and it's always a great reality check when it doesn't work that way you think oh i booked um i booked a broadway tour so the next thing is i'm going to be on broadway or i booked a broadway show so now i'm going to be in broadway shows from now on and it it doesn't always work that way right you think oh i I booked a swing and i'm i'm amazing as as a swing so now i'm going to be seen as this and i'm going to book this but in reality it's like no you're amazing as a swing and now people have learned how valuable you are as a swing and they want you as a swing and or same with you know understudying i found myself kind of i so my first like big gig was uh the mama mia tour oh wow and i I was on the first CETA tour to ever exist when CETA tours came about. And um, so I did the, I did Mamma Mia, the second national tour. We called it Mamma Mia 2.0, or maybe it was just the only national tour, but it was the only national tour, but then it was a CETA contract. So I don't know, I digress. But uh, anyways, I did that and I understudied Sophie Sherrod. I understudied, you know, the girl Sophie Sheridan and I understudied her friend Allie um and that was a great opportunity I learned a lot and then I it I kind of have this um pattern in my career that I found which is the bravery of saying no and trusting your gut yeah I really appreciate you saying that because it is the hardest thing for actors yeah. to learn to, to to say no and and to know that's okay yeah for yeah. sure um because we but in in for no fault right because we love what we do so we also it's hard to and, we, and we all think it can be taken from us at any moment you know until you are leo or brad pitt and maybe even those guys think you know one of them is going to take it from the other you know well totally and i think yeah. i think in theater probably I haven't actually experienced this in film so much, but I think in theater, if one thing theater teaches you, it, it is that you are replaceable at any second. The show must go on. <laughs> it's, whereas, I feel like it's not so much that way in film and TV, or at least so I've experienced it. I'm sure it is, obviously. Yeah. If theater teaches you anything, it's like, no, you're replaceable at any moment, probably for better or for worse, right? Yeah. It makes us always paranoid. It makes us hustle that much harder. Um, but 
Yeah, so I was on tour with Mamma Mia, and I had been on tour for a year, and we had a little layoff for a few weeks, and I auditioned for a regional production of Next to Normal. And I was offered the, you know, the teenage girl in Next to Normal. What is her name? Natalie. I, I, I forget the name of the role, yeah. but I, um, I thought, okay, well, I really want to play this role, so I think I'm going to put my notice in for the tour. And yeah, it's only like a two-month gig at a regional theater, but I've missed playing, I've missed lines, I've missed dialogue, and I, I would like, I've been in the ensemble for Mamma Mia for a year, and I feel like I need to brush up my chops, and I want to be in a leading role, and I'm going to go, I'm going to be brave and leave my cushy paycheck of tour, yeah. which was why I was making that kind of money. Um, and I'm going to go do this job for this only going to last two months. And so I decided and I, I put in my notice and the universe came back to me. And about five minutes after I put in my notice, casting called my agent and said, OK, well, her track is opening up on Broadway. So would she like to come and do it on Broadway and make her Broadway debut? And I uh, yeah, sure. You know, of yeah. course, that, that was I. I was excited to go do next and normal for two months and leave tour, and then that bravery of leaving that paycheck came tenfold and said, "Well, your track opened up on Broadway, so you can come." And had I not wow. noticed, I don't think they would have asked me to to do it. You know, there's plenty of people on that Ross. Who knows? Maybe they would have. But um, so that worked out, and then another kind of. Uh, go with your gut be brave story and was when I was auditioning for Wicked so with Mamma Mia I I did Mamma Mia I went and I did the Broadway company and I was on a, a typical ensemble contract where I could do six weeks out at any or six a six, six week out six week out at any time so it was actually to the day pretty much um at six weeks I had auditioned for Ghost, which was going to be an original Broadway musical, and I was auditioning for to understudy Casey Levy in Ghost, and I, I, I booked it, and so I put in my notice around to the day of six months of my Broadway or six weeks of my Broadway debut on Mamma Mia, I put in my notice that I was going to leave to go do Ghost, and so I, I went from understudying in Mamma Mia to understudying in Ghost, and. Ghost was such a cool experience and it was the first time I was in an original cast and yeah. then I again was fortunate that when Ghost was closing I had already lined up my next gig and was doing Scandalous on Broadway wow. understudying Carolee Carmelo and just and that was a whole other epic thing I mean Carolee Carmelo and is you know Carolee Carmelo and um and then it was when that show was not such a hit um and i got an audition for wicked which i'd been always wanted to get an audition for wicked for for the broadway replacement or for tour i think it was just a kind of general got it got it got it i think it was for the first national tour the second national tour and broadway yeah also let me ask since we're kind of glossing do you like the touring life of, of the musical thing? Because I know a lot of, you know, musical theater actresses and actors, they love that life or they don't like that life. And I'm curious for you, you know, growing up with a family in Houston and then coming to New York, how did you respond to that new town, new, you know, every three to four days or a week or so? Did, did you like that life? I loved it. Yeah. Yeah, I really liked it. Traveling is such a big part of, I'm I'm like a I'm a wanderer, you know. I'm a I You're an artist. That's what I you like, have to be, you know. I like to be out and about. I love traveling. I like being outside. I like camping. I like I don't like monotony and I don't like doing the same thing. I I don't thrive in that environment. I thrive in in my independence and I thrive in being in new places. And coming from Houston, never having a driver's license and moving you know to new york as a teenager and having that independence for the first time of like being able to go somewhere yeah 
from a subway, you know, on a subway to then going on tour and getting to travel around and do what I love, it, getting to travel and then at night getting to perform. Yeah. Was, I, I loved it. I loved the lifestyle. And I could also recognize that it was hard and it brings out, I think tour brings out people's, I don't mean to, weakness is like not the right word, but I feel like tour brings out, and demons isn't the right word either, but it sheds light into areas of your life that you might be suppressing, you know? Yeah. Tour, it's, if somebody has addiction issues, it's really easy on tour to struggle with addiction. If I'm five years has, sober, not I, tour exactly. is the reason I'm, I'm an awesome. addict. Yeah. Wow. I was, I did the rock band tour though. So it was, it was definitely a little more cocaine and, and wild than it was, you know, musical. <laughs> it's the same. It's that yeah. thing. It's yeah. Did you like touring? I thought I love it. Was, I mean, the hardest part for me was coming home. You know, it was like, because you can live that lifestyle, you know, cause the booze is free and you know, like the band was sponsored and, you know, okay. I was young and girls and it was just fun. It was like, what I dreamed about when I was an eight year old kid, like jamming Nirvana on my bed. And then I was living that life and I was a roadie. I wasn't in the band, but it was like the perks for the same. So yeah, I, I totally lost my mind. <laughs> it's, it's like the best of times and the worst of times, right? Yeah. Oh like, yeah, for sure. It's yeah. So I, I did recognize that it's same with like, if you struggle with loneliness, you know, tour is the thing that's going to bring that out in you. Oh or... God, it's so hard. You know, if it weren't for FaceTime and some of these things we have now, I, I don't know how people used to do it. Yeah. I mean, I don't, I'm trying to think if there was, I guess there was, yeah, I guess there was FaceTime in 2011. Was there? Yeah. for Yeah. It was like, it was like three megapixels, but you got the idea. For what. <laughs> just trying to figure it out. I guess you're right. Um, but yeah so but i did like it i really did love it and um i also think it'd be really cool you know now that now i did it when i was single and young and um and i ended up you know of course i would date somebody that i was on tour with one of the time oh no you know and then i also did another with mom or with you know mom me i ended up dating a guy that was on tour with me and we dated for a long time but then with uh wicked i was on tour and in a long distance relationship. And now I look at it and I talk about it with my husband, Matthew, all the time. We're in a band together. And I'm like, it'd be so cool if we could go on tour together. Yeah. You know? Oh, it could be awesome. <laughs> yeah, that'd be cool. Were you, um, were you writing your own music even before Matthew while you were on these tours? Yeah, I did. I did write a little bit. Um, I did write a little bit on tour. I, started writing more so after tour i started really writing i would say no i started writing in ghost so i started writing before um i did a lot of writing on the wicked tour and i did dabbled in it and mom mia tour but it was kind of during ghost that i started uh it's so funny i'm like what i don't know what year that was but i could tell you what yeah <laughs> um and Just then, tell me who the president was, and that's all we needed. Right? Yeah. Obama was the president. Yeah. But I um, I really started writing more after. I definitely write more now that I am married to somebody who, you know, he's been, he's been writing since he was, like, a child and an amazing writer. And I would write songs, but I wouldn't necessarily share them with people mm-hmm. and, until I met him. And then we started writing together and, and you know. Now the floodgates are open and now I'm always writing, but. Um. It, so, you know, obviously I know we've been in a pandemic for about 18 months now, sadly, but th- was the 54 below don't tell mama, was that part of, you know, you workshopping some of your own work or have you not done that yet? Um, well, we did do a little thing at um, 54 below. We did like, a, we did like four songs. Um, oh, awesome. We did do like a little, it was, so Corey Mock does a thing called um, Broadway Sings and he, you know, he gets these Broadway, he gets these Broadway performers to come and sing cover songs of different, you know, successful artists and, or, you know, popular artists, I should say. And, but he, and he's done like such a great job doing these concerts 
that he decided, he's like, oh, I want to do a concert called Broadway Sings Their Own. And so he got about five of us um, to come and play like four or five of our original songs. And so it made up a whole evening. So we did that there. Um, but we haven't done the Don't Tell Mama, but we have, um, we've done a gig at Green Room 42. You know, we have definitely played out. We've, well, we've all right, cool. But um, we, you know, want to play out more for sure. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, hopefully once this crazy Delta variant gets figured out, you know, it, lo it looked like we were getting there, but America, man, you know? Yeah, um, we, we like playing to it, like rock, ban rock venues and stuff, like the, you know, uh, oh my gosh, why am I blanking on names? Like the Bowery. Oh, the Bowery Ballroom? Bowery Electric. Is Bowery Electric is great. Yeah, yeah. Electric and yeah. what is the other one down there? Mercury Lounge or something like Pianos, that? Pianos, Mercury Lounge. Uh, We've done a lot of those. Yeah. Sort of, but, Rockwood um, Music Hall. Yeah. yeah. We That's opened a for August. Or we played one night. We opened for Augustana one night, which was cool. Wow. And, uh, Haley Reinhardt. Oh, my God. Am I blanking on her name? No, that's who it is. But so that was pretty cool. That's amazing. And so then when does Waitress happen? So Waitress happened. Why? It's so funny because, you know, once you talk about pandemic, you're like, oh, what year? What? I day? know that it's oh. we've like lost three years. It feels like. actually since Trump became president, 2016 till now has just been. Exactly. Oh, yeah. God. Yeah. That was, yeah. 2019 was when Waitress happened. That was. um. And that was pretty cool. I, I actually had, I auditioned for Waitress back in the day. I auditioned originally to replace, um, I mean, Sarah replaced Jesse Mueller, but to replace Sarah. So I was in the first round of auditions for replacements. And um, it was the same week as I had an audition for Frozen that week, an audition for Escape to Margaritaville, and an audition for Waitress. And it was, it was kind of all the same women were at all of those things, right? Yeah. And um, I remember thinking, and it's funny how everything works out. I remember being like, well, I really, really, really want to play Jenna and Waitress one day. Like, I love that musical from the second I saw Jesse Mueller in it. And from the second I saw that, and I'm a huge Jesse Mueller fan and Sarah Bareilles fan. And the second I saw it as the curtain went up I looked at my husband and I was like I have to do this I want to do this so bad one day and and Frozen I could tell was like wow what an epic opportunity it would be to do something like that and to originate Elsa but at the same time I was like that I don't think that's my gig that's not meant for me I'm yeah. not I'm not supposed to I'm not supposed to do that it doesn't feel right um but, you know, I, I just trust that things will fall into place. And I remember thinking, Escape to Margaritaville. Huh, that's interesting. Yeah. But I really want to originate something. So the whole time going into these weeks, I was like, I really want to originate. I really want to originate. It's not necessarily what I thought of, but I want to originate. And so I remember going into that audition. It was I kind of found out about it last minute. And it was my first audition was in front of a lot of the creatives. And... They said, bring a Jimmy Buffett song, but I couldn't find the chords to the song that I wanted to sing. So I was like, all right, whatever. I'm just going to bring in my guitar and play. There's nothing about the character. She doesn't play. She doesn't. Yeah. Play. But whatever. I'm going to do that anyways. Um, and it just so happened to work out that I booked Escape to Margaritaville. And why that's funny is because, you know, then years later, Waitress comes back remembers my audition from you know that time and I get an offer to do waitress but even more so why it's it's funny and kismet how those things work out is one of the co-writers Mike O'Malley who co-wrote Escape to Margaritaville the book with Greg Garcia he uh then comes to me a day after waitress my final performance of waitress and says this is, you know, many years after we, a couple of years after we did Escape to Margaritaville. And he says, hey, I, um, I'm i working on this show called Heels, and I think you're perfect for um, The Young Matriarch. I really would love for you to read the script, see if you it resonates with you. And if it does, I want you to put yourself out on tape and audition. Wow. And were so, you doing film TV yet or, or not really? I, this, well... Not yet. So 
with with waitress and and I know I'm like skipping timelines all back and forth here you know so I did escape to Margaritaville for a while and then till that closed and yeah and break where I was auditioning and uh then waitress came along and it was I was that was awesome I was super excited to do waitress but it was interesting because um my I originally signed on I had another offer other than waitress and I was torn between the two and I decided to go with waitress and um, my contract was cut short my contract was I was uh, it was was cut short which I was I was like I never talk about this I I was devastated I was supposed to do it for longer than I was and truth was is they were like we're not selling well and we're we're gonna gonna shut the show down right well we're gonna find someone else to play the role and I was really, first of all, I'm really lucky that it, it was Jordan Sparks because she's the most badass human being ever. And yeah. to pass the torch to her was like so cool because she's just, uh, she just evokes love and peace and just good vibes. And I I wish we could have done the show together. I don't know how yeah. that would have happened, but she's just such a cool person. Um, but I was really bummed because I, you know, I didn't get to do the role as long as I thought I was going to get to do the role as long as I was contracted to do the role for. And I remember thinking, man, this is just like, oh, it bums me out. Like, yeah, it's business, man. Sell tickets or what, you know, I don't know what it was. And, um, and I was really bummed by it. But again, everything happens for a reason. I, my final performance was on, I don't know what night it was, probably a Sunday. It was a Monday afternoon. Michael Malley texts me about, hey, how's Waitress going? I said, I, oh, I just finished my contract. And that's when he told me, I think you should audition for the show. I had I'd been auditioning for TV and film, but nothing had stuck. I hadn't, yeah. I hadn't done anything. I'd been pinned for a few things and some close calls, but hadn't really stepped foot into that world yet. I was on one episode of um, FBI and I died. <laughs> <before the laughs> nice. You know, like, <laughs> within 30 seconds i was yeah. the episode was about my character that was killed so i wasn't even in the episode hard wow. i know how yeah. it goes yeah you know it's like one of those shows you're like uh oh, don't blink procedurals don't yeah don't totally i'm late you're gonna miss me um but the same time to answer your question had i done it done tv and film yet i the day that i found out that i had a screen test for heels after I sent in a self tape the day I found out I had a screen test for heels was the same day I found out that I had a chemistry read for New Amsterdam which was something I had auditioned for also yeah and so I booked them within like the same day I found out I after I did my chemistry or after I did my screen test for heels I found out that like I I was going to work on New Amsterdam for a seven episode arc um to play you know the lead character's new love interest so it kind of all happened at once and that's that's really all i've done that's <laughs> In incredible that, you know so but and, it was and, kind of cool that i had that that warm-up to that experience on new amsterdam before jumping into heels yeah because i i you know chris is a friend i remember talking to him because it you guys had it it was gonna go then it was on pause and then there was a question about whether it was going to be able to come back or not right heels yeah yeah so, well f- i mean at least for the pandemic for sure so there was yeah we were supposed to start filming when did the world shut down around march like, 2020 march 15th or something yeah. or 13th or something like that well we were supposed to fly out to atlanta to start filming march 17th like within a oh. week we were to start a week after the shutdown happened so you know that was postponed and of course i think everyone was nervous like well are we actually going to get to do it and then yeah we ended up going to work in august which and then that was a whole weird thing because in a way i it was not lost on me that here i was like having the only way i'd made money since i had a side hustle as a nanny when i was 20 back in 2009 or 2010, I, I'd only been making my living off of theater. Yeah. And now the world is shut down and it just so happens I get to go do my first like 
big TV gig. It, it was, I had survivor's guilt in a way, and it was not lost on me that, like, had I not been, had I not miraculously all of a sudden been able to go work on a TV show, I would, I'd have no money left. Yeah. I would be where I would be. I would, you know, I'd be in the same position a lot of my friends are. And um, <clears throat> so that definitely, that, that was not lost on me that I just so happened to have a little bit of a altering career trajectory at that yeah point. but you, you you worked really hard for it and and you know I, I i do believe as crazy as this business is you know good people good work and and good persistence it brings something and and so you deserved it you know and you worked yeah. so hard for that and i'm so glad it came your way talk to me did did were all the scripts done did you know the arc of the show or was it still kind of being written you know so when when I first auditioned, I had read the first three episodes. Got it. Um, and then when I was brought on to the show, I think the most episodes I had going into filming was one through four. Okay. That was that was the most we had was one through four. That was the most any of the cast had had. And um, Mike O'Malley, the showrunner and one of the writers on the show, Michael Waldron created the show. Mike O'Malley is the showrunner and, and wrote on it and is also in it. And um, he was very much like, I don't want to, I don't want to tell everyone what happens. I want the cast to have like a surprise. Yeah, to, I love that. I don't want everyone to know what's going to happen yet to with their characters. But, you know, we were one of, if not the first set to start filming during COVID. So with that brought challenges and a couple weeks in, two of our cast members came down with COVID and then that means whoever's around them, whoever had scenes with them, they all have yeah. to, that means you're the bulk of your cast and your cameramen that were around them and your crew is quarantining. Yeah. You're quarantining, but this is a lot of money that needs to be, you know. Yeah, it's just burning cash. So I, you know, they take a day off to figure out what they're going to do. And then I get a call from, and the same thing happened with Chris, because it was Chris, Alan Maldonado, and I, the three of us that were not, did not have to quarantine. No way, thank so God. <laughs> didn't have to quarantine. That being said, there's not a whole lot we can do without the other people that, you know, are the other series regulars so we were still filming episode one and episode two when mike o'malley calls me and says hey next week i need you to film a scene from episode eight wow. and we had gotten scripts one through four he's like i'm going to give you six through eight you need to read them over the weekend and or sorry five through eight you need to read them over the weekend don't tell anybody what happens and come film this this scene from episode eight and we're still filming episode one I hadn't yeah even... now you got to play the end at the beginning you know <laughs> i didn't even filmed my first scene in the show my character's introduction oh my god house and that's crazy characters last scenes in the in the series so that was a uh, crazy... acting exercise to say the least <laughs> yeah so that yeah. was a... but um yeah that was other than that we kind of got the scripts you know a couple weeks ahead of time we would have a table read and then but then they would ever, you know, they would be ever evolving and always changing. And Michael O'Malley is such an incredible writer. And the fact that he doesn't ever, he's constantly working. I don't know when he sleeps and he's an incredible husband and father to his family. So I don't really know how, how he does it all, but he yeah. manages to do it. And and you and Steven have such incredible chemistry and you're so incredible in that show, Allison. I mean, you, you're oh, just, so. you, you nail that. I mean, it's uh you know, it's a time of, you know, people talking about strong female and it, you just bring, you know, for a role that could be flat, perhaps on a page, you bring so much life to it and you, you feel for her. And, and I'm so grateful for your work. It, it's so beautiful to watch and, and you glow, man, you're, you're going to be a, you're going to be a motherfucking superstar, dude. Uh, I, can I don't know about that, but yeah, you, you heard it here first. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. So, you know, I know you guys finished a few months ago, but how's it feel now that it's coming out? It feels good. It's funny. I, I had like a little, um, I called my best friend yesterday who I've been best friends with since I was two years old. She's, you know, she's a personal trainer, a mom of two, a wife herself, still living in Houston, Texas. And 
nowhere near in the industry, but she knows me more than, she knows me better than anyone. We've been best friends since I was two. And it's funny, I called her and had a good cry yesterday, <laughs> just in the fact that like, I, I, I feel so, I feel so honored to get to do what I get to do. And, but, and I loved, I like the work aspect. I love like, you know, the acting aspect and yeah. work. Now I'm kind of learning how to navigate this other side of things, which is, you know, the stuff that comes with it, which I don't necessarily think I'm as good at as, you know, I miss theater in a way and I, I love it and I'm so excited and I'm trying and I'm here now and I'm just taking in the moment and it's also just navigating this crazy time that we're in and, yeah. and having that, like, I think everyone is just kind of like, there's this, I was talking about it today, this like underbelly of like, not not even necessarily anxiety but like this like agitation right like this like oh, yeah. this, um just emotional like spillover like i just feel very emotionally charged yeah. to speak which is why i'm probably talking a mile a no, minute i completely <laughs> concur i think we're all feeling it and especially the more you turn the news on you know the more the more that just exacerbates the situation and you know, I mean, it, it is is Broadway something, you know, now that you have this, I know, I'm telling you, incredible film career coming your way. You, do you still want to make room for theater once a year, once every few years? Is is that important always. to you? Yeah, always. I mean, I, I've definitely caught the bug for, I've definitely caught the, you know, TV bug and the on-camera bug. I, for sure, and I've fallen in love with film and, and that world, um, and certainly caught the bug and loved doing it. But there, there will just never be anything like theater for me. There yeah. will never be that. Um, it's in in and, and there's way and there's things that you know, TV and film have to offer that that theater don't that give you a whole other escape. But there's like this catharticism with theater, right? There's I don't know if it's selfishness or what, but it, there's a catharticism that comes out of theater that you get to you get to go on the journey every single night from well, start. Well, it's, it's alive, you know what I mean? And, yeah. And you know the response is immediate, you know. And it and if you feel it's bad, you got to work to win them back. And it's just so cool, you know. That's it's what we love to do as actors, you know. Yeah, and you get to go on the journey from start to finish. Yeah. Where I, you know, for TV or film, it's like you don't get to go on the whole journey at once. No. And then you got to do coverage and it's so awkward and it's just, else, yeah. And you don't get to rehearse and you don't get to like, but not to say I didn't, I don't love it and have fallen in love with other aspects of it that theater can't offer. And so that is, um, but to go back to your question, I feel great and I'm really, really excited for, I feel great, emotionally charged and very, very excited for just for people to see it you know yeah. um, it's it's a story i would watch if i wasn't in it and i think going into it i was really worried that like okay am i going to be able to and i struggled with it because i'm new to this but of like removing my own ego and watching something and not judging myself every second which yeah. i do which we all do but um but then within like the first few episodes I did notice I was like oh I'm kind of forgetting I'm watching myself and I'm kind of forgetting I'm watching Chris Bauer and and my friends and uh I'm like invested in these people yeah and, that's how it's great writing that's what it does yeah. and great acting yeah, yeah. Well, but yeah I think it's a testament to the writing and to the to the characters and the town that we've created Alex and Steven are great as well yeah it's just such a great cast and I got to ask, you know, a few funnel questions. Do you, do you know what's next for you? Or can you not say anything? No, um, I uh, I don't have any secrets, but I, um, you know, I'm continuing to write and my husband and I have a full album recorded that we need to put out, but we kind of wanted to align that with, you know, piggyback, piggyback off of heels and, you know, get some more, have help getting some listeners for that, so. So where could everyone that will want to listen to that ultimately find it when the time is ready available on all music platforms so right now we have three singles out and we have an entire album that we have under not. under your name or what's oh, the sorry. name under uh big sir bound that is our band name big it's sir. gonna be linked below guys make sure to check it out 
Thank you. Yes. Yeah, so yeah. Every, um, available on all music platforms uh, under the name Big Sur Bound is our band name, and Instagram our band name is Big Sur Bound Official. Um, and my Instagram is very original, Allison Luff, and you can always go to mine and then go to my bio, and it's first thing I'll, there. I'll I'm tag sure. it all out, and yeah. and that's amazing, Allison. I'm so proud of you. I mean, you're Thanks. you're you're doing it. You know, like take a take a moment to step outside of yourself and. And, and, and just enjoy it. Enjoy the ride that's coming because the show's going to be a hit and the world is going to fall in love with you. And there's going to be so many more amazing things coming your way. And I'm going to be begging for you to come back very soon. Well, and, I because I would love to. You're so fun to talk to and you're easy to talk to. <laughs> oh, same, same. Fun, final question. And uh, there are two questions. It's kind of a two-parter. Um, I know you were very fortunate to to be able to work a bit, but you know, for all those artists that are are struggling during this pandemic and don't have a creative outlet, any any words of wisdom to them? I think that the only thing we can do is is take everything minute by minute, and I think if if it's always a great reminder that like the best person doesn't always get the job, yeah. the best person, whatever the fuck that means, yeah. But if it's meant for you, it, it will be for you. It will not pass you by. And the only thing we can do is remain ready to be in that moment. And I think the only way we can be ready for that moment is just to continuously find our life outside of our work. You know, yeah. I think as actors, we dedicate our entire, it's, it's our world and because it's our passion. And we're so lucky that we get to do what we're passionate about. But there's got to be, who are you? Like, who who are you because once you figure out who you are that's the only thing you can bring to the table that no other human being can bring and no other person can do that better than you yeah. and that's your niche you know screw all the other niches like that's your niche is is who you are yeah so beautifully put and and final question you know if you had any advice for that young 19 year old allison that moved to new york city and you could go back and tell her for all those that you know are planning when Broadway's back and the world is back to come do it in any advice for those budding actors that want to make the move and and plunge on into the musical theater scene I think that is that is my main advice that I would go back and tell myself because I that's when I noticed the the career shift for me at least or the I don't even I don't even mean career shift but like the turn of the dial right yeah. and that just like the fork that came and then I took that's when I took the left instead of the right was when I kind of started discovering like, sure, you can be super inspired by these. A, it doesn't ever hurt you to root for someone else. It doesn't yeah. make, it doesn't make your journey any less. It doesn't make you any less talented to think someone is really talented. And I think one thing I did growing up that is that I didn't necessarily have to learn was I did always root for that other person. I could always see like, wow, they're so good and they're, yeah. they're amazing and that's why. But the thing I think I did do was, okay, I should try to do what they're doing. Like I should, I should try to figure that out. Like I, I like the way they dress. Like I like the way they sing, like this is cool. And I would kind of try to do that. And it wasn't until I realized, yeah, but who am I? Like, what, what do I have to say? How do I like to dress? How do I like to sing? It doesn't matter if it sounds like, this person or that person it's how i sing and yeah i brought my guitar in because i can't find the music to the song i want to sing and this is what i want to sing yeah. so i think i'd give the same advice which is just figure out who you are and you don't have to know we are we will never know who we are yeah. like it's an ongoing before. process where someone new every day you know yeah but like yeah. just try to bring yourself to the table because that's that's the only thing you're going to do better than anyone else i love that Allison, this is incredible. You're the best. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks for having me. This was so fun. Yeah, I can't let, wait to listen to it. Yeah, let's do it again. Yeah, okay. Me. I don't need to hear me, but I'll listen to Chris Bowers. Or something. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Touche. Allison, love. I got so much love for you. Okay. Thanks, man. You too. All right. To be continued.